So one of the worst insults you can offer a social justice activist is that he or she is hostile or closed-minded. I can say from personal experience, it really takes a hard stab at what it means to be an activist. The social justice movement ending in the word justice is all about acceptance, collaboration, and diversity, and using these to promote open-mindedness. And yet, in recent years, I've heard more and more individuals accuse modern feminism of becoming a movement full of hostility and exclusivity, as well as narrow-mindedness. And despite my relentless dedication to this social justice movement, I can't help but realize that some of these accusations are true. In general, the feminist movement has undergone a series of changes that have moved it towards, instead of making broad-ranging appeal, appealing to certain demographics, which has limited the, which has increased the hostility of the movement. Today, I will be providing a very brief and definitely not comprehensive overview of the accidental evolution of hostile feminism and what we can do about it. But before I go any further into shedding light on this phenomenon of hostile feminism, I would like to talk a little bit about myself and my interest and investment in this topic. So my name is Divya Rajesh. I'm 17 years old and a high school senior. I have identified as a feminist for as long as I can recall, originally because I noticed that the world was a place full of injustice, especially based on gender, but more recently because I'm interested in undoing the mechanisms of discrimination and oppression through activism and conversation. I know that's one tall order, but there's always a place to start. So I've served as the president of the League of Social Activists ever since my sophomore year, and the club's mission statement is essentially to raise awareness about social issues that exist in our community. And over the course of the time, I've had a blast working with my club members in order to address and discuss various social topics, ranging from animal rights to racial justice and everything in between. But our conversations always follow a very consistent structure. Each week we have a person present a lecture on a topic related to social justice and then follow it up with thoughtful conversation. And for a while this was my vision of what a social justice club should look like. However, recently uh, one of my club members had brought to my attention that these conversations were very one-sided and our organization had evolved into a very homogenous group of individuals. And at that moment I had realized my, one of my failures. I realized that raising awareness amongst a highly aware audience was not raising awareness. And with that in mind, I started my senior year and declared it the year of acknowledging oppositional viewpoints and trying to engage with the opposition, the apathetic, and the uninterested and integrate them into the social justice movement. So in the past, when I've been confronted with the oppositional viewpoints, I use a very simple mo mental model to address these viewpoints, and I think most of you will be able to relate to it. So when someone presents, I call it the stupid mean diagnostic test, and I promise it doesn't involve a lot of science or math. Um, when I was confronted with an oppositional viewpoint, I either considered it because A, the individual was ignorant about the topic, or B, because they were well informed on the topic but too self-interested or inconsiderate to come to a well-logic conclusion. And while this rhetoric is probably harsher than most can identify with, this idea and assumption that those that disagree with us have some sort of fundamental logical or emotional failure is something that's very prevalent in our culture. And if this assumption was true, all that would be needed is a little education for the Patricks of the world and a little counseling for the Tazes of the world to make everyone think exactly the way we do. But the problem is that that's not the case. Opposition will perpetually exist as individuals have unique experiences, values, and thought processes that allow them to come to the conclusions they do. And so here I am trying to integrate oppositional viewpoints into a social justice movement while also remaining true to the values that make up social justice. And while I have these intentions, the evolution of the feminist movement is moving it toward more hostile and exclusive rhetoric that is often caused by unintentional changes. So throughout the course of my talk today, I will be perverse, first providing definitions of the progression of the feminist movement and setting the foundation of our conversation, followed by talking about how and why the feminist movement has become more hostile and exclusive, and then providing tips on how we can all better integrate diverse perspectives and diverse opinions into our social justice conversations. So let's start with basic definitions. 
So modern feminism, or feminism of the 21st century, is feminism that relies on a movement that involves emphasizing that all individuals have equal, that deserve equal rights, respect, and opportunity, regardless of race, gender, class, etc. It incorporates racial justice, environmental justice, economic justice, etc., in order to suggest that the best way to address gender-based issues is through widespread activism and involvement. However, this has not always been the case. In the past, in previous generations, feminism was more narrowly defined as a movement promoting women's rights and promoting equality between men and women. And with this more narrow definition in the past, during the 19th and 20th century, during the first and second waves of feminism, people often catered to larger audiences in order to appeal any, to anyone who is willing to support the feminist movement. And with these broad ranging appeals, early feminists were able to partner with the African American community and the LGBTQ community in order to advance their agenda. And while the feminist movement was largely still run by white wealthy females, these rhetorical strategies were much more broad appealing um, as far as their audience and the people they were trying to attract. So in general, modern feminism has broadened in scope but narrowed in the individuals it's trying to attract. And while this shift seems counterintuitive, I believe that there are two major factors that can be considered responsible for this trend. And both of them are largely tied to the 21st century. The first is the concept of intersectionality, which has largely been adopted into 21st century feminism. The second is the influx of social media culture, which is largely also a 21st century phenomenon. So intersectionality. Primarily, the broadened scope of feminism is largely due to the concept of intersectionality. A, a term first coined by black feminist Kimberly Crenshaw in the 1980s, intersectionality is the concept that the oppression we experience is due to the interlinked elements of our identity, and thus, no single element of our identity is responsible for the experience we have with oppression. So for example, the oppression of a Latina woman faces is not only due to the fact that she is a woman, or her race, but more broadly because of the combination of her race and gender, and thus cannot be compared to the oppression a white woman faces or the oppression a Latino man faces. And so while intersectionality has had many positive impacts, including it has broadened the appeals, or it has broadened um, the diversity of the individuals engaging in the movement and has created this overwhelming push for understanding that oppression manifests itself in different forms. Um, in many senses, intersectionality has been misused within the feminist movement. So example number one is the Now This video. So Now This is an online news source in which, it, affiliated with the Huffington Post, that is often popular on Facebook. And it created, released a video in 2015 on the concept of white feminism. So white feminism is essentially a type of feminism that is dominated by white women and fails to address components of intersectionality and the role that race pay plays in issues that women experience. And so the idea presented in this video is that critiquing white feminism isn't about silencing those women. It's about opening space for even more diverse voices to be heard. And this message is one that resonates with most of the social justice community, including myself. However, the rhetoric being used in the video includes statements like, being a white feminism doesn't make you a bad person, it just means you have a lot to learn. And also, it ends with the statement, sometimes as white ladies, we just need to shut the F up. And so if we consider this sort of rhetoric that's being used, the message here is not that we should work on engaging more individuals of color in the movement, but it's that less diverse individuals should not participate in the movement as much instead of engaging more with diverse voices that can inform the perspective. In addition, this, this hostile rhetoric that suggests that it, because of less diverse identities, people need to silence themselves or they have a lot to learn creates an overarching vibe that the feminist movement is hostile and exclusive. So the second example that I'm presenting today that involves the discouragement of individuals of less diverse identities getting involved in the feminist movement is an article provided by Everyday Feminism, which is an online magazine that addresses feminist issues and is popular on Facebook and other mediums as well. 
So the title of this art of this article is "So You Want to Be a Male Feminist? Here are seven here are eleven simple rules to follow." And so a lot of these guidelines are provided up here, but the ones that I would like to highlight is that are, are number one: understand that women are leading the way and affirm their capable leadership. Don't assert yourself at the forefront. Number three: men don't get to determine if they are allies to the feminist movement. Women do. And number seven, when given opportunities to execute professional tasks to feminist issues, consider referring other women instead. And 11, when women criticize your involvement in feminism, don't talk over them or talk down to them. Actively listen and be accountable. And while I agree with all of these guidelines for male engagement within modern feminism, they create the overarching message that male input into feminism is not in enhancing the dialogue at all. Not only have we told men that their input, that they don't get to decide whether they are considered an ally, but we have also suggested that their only role in the movement is to refer tasks to women and also be quiet and listen. So my point here is not that these messages are wrong. My point is that the, these rhetorical strategies have created this impression that, um, that, feminism has, that feminism is a movement that only relies on the identities of the most oppressed. Intersectionality was not supposed to be about silencing those that are not the most diverse individuals. It was a movement founded upon this idea that each individual has a unique identity and a unique expression of oppression, and that is what informs their perspective. And thus, we should work on integrating as many perspectives as possible into our dialogue. So the second major influence on this rise of hostile fem feminism is the rise of social media. Now, almost every fe browsing through feminist art on Tumblr or reading feminist articles on Facebook or following their, fam their favorite feminist crusaders on Twitter. And in general, social media has done amazing things to the feminist movement from allowing feminists to connect from around the world and also making it easier for everyone to become an activist in their own way. However, these factors have had two major effects on the feminist movement and the phenomenon of hostile feminism. Number one, the rise, of, the rise of social media has allowed essentially anyone to become an activist. As Facebook allows individuals with the click of a button to advocate for peace in Paris or support marriage equality in the United States, there's been a huge rise in mainstream social justice movements. And as basic economic theory goes, increase in supply leads to a decrease in demand. And thus the feminist movement is no longer looking for to integrate as all the voices that exist, but specifically targeting, engaging mo more diverse individuals who are still underrepresented in the movement. The second major effect that social media has had on the feminist movement is it has created this sharing culture where articles are out to gain as many clicks and views as possible. And what this does is that it makes it more common for articles to use catchy titles, for example, referring back to the Everyday Feminism article, titles that involve lists and numbers, such as 11 reasons why blank, or six things blank shouldn't do, or why blank is racist. And why these titles garner a lot of public attention? A lot of times they oversimplify issues and comb over nuances that exist in feminist culture. And this creates the overall impression that feminism is hostile to many different ideas, while it is an area full of nuances and implicit messages, as well as um, subtleties. So given these changes in the feminist movement, we are forced to deal with a feminist culture that in many senses seem more hostile, even though we are aiming to integrate more perspectives into the social justice conversation. So as I tried to learn to integrate better perspectives and traditional as well as non-traditional identities into my social justice work, I came, I came across some tips for how to better integrate perspective, different perspectives and different identities into social justice work and I'd like to present them with, to you today. So firstly, meet people where they're at. Try to find common ground between your cause and the interests of other people in order to find more genuine examples of how their work, your work applies to their life. As demonstrated by this graphic, there are a lot of intersections between our interests in addition to our identities. Number two, avoid harsh buzzwords when pointing out insensitivities. Mainstream media has often 
made the feminist movement seem very hostile by using words that come across as very as very attacking towards certain identities. So for example, terms like that's racist or that's sexist or microaggression or you're a misogynist page or part of the patriarchy or an oppressor often come across as attacking someone's identity rather than correcting them and teaching them how to better engage with the feminist movement. And so use terms that are more like that's a little insensitive because or most people don't know that blank actually is like blank or it's a misconception that blank. So number three, instill a sense of purpose in everyone. People like to engage in issues that they feel like they have a role to play in. And so by giving people a sense of leadership in organizations and providing them with a sense of their identity is unique and that they have something to contribute to a movement, this instills a sense of purpose in them as well as gets them more interested and enthusiastic about different issues. Number four, let others learn the limitations of their perspective independently. The best way to do, to do this is to acknowledge the limitations of your own perspective and create a culture where acknowledging limitations is the norm. Number five, use intersectionality to be inclusive rather than exclusive. Remember that intersectionality is about identifying that each person experiences oppression in a different way, not about finding the ideal intersections of oppression and using certain identities as the face of the movement. In fact, remember that, apathy, that the opposite of love is <coughs> apathy, not hate. Focus on informing and involving those who are less familiar with their issues rather than spending all your time arguing with those that are against your initiatives. And lastly, try to determine why others are not as dedicated to a cause as much as you are. There are a lot of barriers that keep people from getting involved in issues that don't involve the same <coughs> the issue itself. For example, timing, logistics, social constraints, lack of awareness, and lack of commitment can all be reasons why people are not as engaged as you wish them to be. Okay, so now that, it, now that we've identified all these tips, I, w I want everyone to be aware that these tips obviously are not going to end all the hostility and exclusivity that exils, exists in the realm of social justice, and clearly this isn't an end-all solution. However, the bottom line is that opinions were intended to fluctuate, ideas were intended to evolve, and perspectives were intended to vary. It's about time we appreciated the dynamic nature of our intellectual expressions and stopped being hostile to those of others. Thank you.